All right. I actually wish I were doing Joe's project. That was like beautiful cartography, and this is a sort of different story. This is not a story about setting out to make the most beautiful map. I'll get to that in a minute. So, um, I'm Morgan Height. This is about, I live in Smithers, and this is about a new set of maps from Mount Inside at Provincial Park. Um, and that wasn't what was supposed to happen. <laughs> it was cool, but not the right thing. That's true. <laughs> Scott. Oh, oh. <laughs> right. oh, wait, why don't we try this tool? No. <laughs> you stay right here. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, a quick uh, reference map, not quite as good as Ekaterina's, but Smithers is here. Mount Isaac Provincial Park is up there near the Yukon border and hemmed in by the Alaska Panhandle. Take us about 10 hours to drive there. Um, it is a remote, rugged area in the Cassiar. And uh, one of the things that you can note about Mount Isa Park, which is just in the center here in this uh, range of mountains, is that the nearest highways are fairly far from the park. There is no road <coughs> access in there. The main feature of the park is this big stratovolcano, which is about a million and a half years old. Um, is a crater which is two kilometers across, it's filled with ice, and uh, the rest of the landscape is quite volcanic. Down here we have the Spectrum Range, which has spectacular colors. Uh, people go in there to go hiking, but not very often. You can't get there from here. So, this is from the page of BC Parks about how to get into Mount Eyes and Provincial Park, and basically they're telling you. The trail is not maintained, it's overgrown, there's a long ford, the bridge is out. Uh, you'll have to arrange for a boat ride across the Stikine River. It must be emphasized the trails are not marked, often overgrown, always difficult to traverse. And then, the, I did not put the bold in, that's actually on the website. This park is not a place for the elephant to experience. So, this is not a park where you're going to find a nice map made by, you know, Jeff. Uh, on sale at NEC because just not enough people go there. The float plane pilot who commonly flies people in from Totoga Lake over here, and that's the standard way people get into the park, they'll fly into one of the lakes, tells me that last year there were three people who attempted the North to South Traverse. Um, however, a friend of mine in Smithers who had done this came to me with the problem, what maps can I use? There are no good maps for Mount Zaza. And I was like, well, what do you mean? What about the totals, right? So, um, before we look at that, we'll just look at the two typical routes people hike. You might get flown into Buckley Lake up there, hike on the red line past the volcano and down to Mogaddy Lake here and be flown out. Or you might be flown into Little Ball Lake here and do a traverse up to Mogaddy Lake to be flown out. Or if you're really, really into the long expedition, maybe two weeks, you could fly into Arctic Lake here and go all the way to Buckley. Um, so the regular 150,000 Anarchan Topos look like they'll do you pretty well. You could do it with four maps if you're going from Buckley Lake to Modadi here, G15, 14G10, 14G9. Um, that's actually three maps. So, but when you actually look into it, because you go to Map Town and you can buy these for about $14 each printed out. Um, the Buckley Lake Quad is dated 1957. <laughs> it literally has the 1957 magnetic declination printed on it, which is fantastic. Um, it's one of those old ones that comes in east and west sheets. And though, although it's you know beautiful cartography, uh, you might worry that this is really old. And then you look at the next sheet, which is 104G10, and it's one of the black and white series. Um, and I don't know if you've ever tried to navigate with these in the backcountry, but quite fantastic. Everything is in black. So the contour lines are in black, the streams are in black, and this black line weaving through the contours is the tree line. And you know that because there's a W here for wooded and a C there for clear. So some people find this impossible to deal with, um, and they don't want to hike on these maps. Uh, and this is the last one where you come up to look at it. Like it's also one of the old 1950s edition maps. So the NTS clause, they're available. It's a reasonable price. Um, but you might decide for, you know, I want something of better scale. Uh, I want something more up to date. 
Um, you could look at the BC trim maps from the province. These are 1 to 20,000. Great scale to hike at. They're free downloads as PDFs. You could just download these and print them out. But they're 28 by 44 inches each. So if you go to your printer and you want to print something, it's probably about $40 a sheet. And you're looking for your height, they're about nine sheets. So that's, what is that, $360 or something like that. Um, so that's fairly prohibitive. So uh, this friend came to me and she was like, what can we do? And I was like, well, with GIS data, we can build the map easily. But the printing cost is the main problem. If we make a nice sheet the size of the NRCAN sheet, right, that's going to be $40. Um, the data is free. Like, this is not going to be hard, right? We can do BC provincial freshwater stuff for all the water features and the ice. We can get names from uh, NRCAN, the DEMs. Very good, right? Vegetation we can generate the contours and the hill shade and QGIS. Um, but the printing costs, right? If we do this in our can topo size piece of paper, that's probably like twenty-five dollars a sheet. Uh, trim maps are forty dollars. So what if we print it on eleven by seventeen? So the advantages: eleven by seventeen. Most offices have a printer that can do this, right? It's very inexpensive. It's about a dollar and a half a page, right? But nobody sells maps that small. So I thought, well, let's try this. So at one to 35,000 maps, which is pretty good for hiking, we'll tile the park on these 11 by 17 pages. Each one is eight kilometers tall and 13 kilometers wide. And uh, well, let's see. Yes. So here's the final project. Product. I'll pass some of these out so you can pass them up the columns there and just have a look. So what we've got here, we have uh, some shaded relief, not done by Blender, that would be so nice, but the idea is to keep this as cheap as possible, right? So it's automatically generated by QGIS. We've got uh, the streams layer, which I'm thickening as I go downhill by using the stream order data. So it looks like it goes downhill. We've got automatically placed labels, we've got a grid, and then we've got the adjacent maps identified in the corners because you need some overlap because you're going to be walking across like one map a day, right? Um, we have ice in purple. And seems like the important stuff. Yeah. Let's see if I had anything else written down to say about that. UTM grid. Yeah. So the whole thing is put together in QGIS, which has this nice atlas feature. If you give it a set of polygons, it will stamp out a map for each polygon. So I give it the grid, and I hit a button and go for coffee, and all 29 map sheets are done in a fairly short time. Um, and so when you buy it, you get an index like this, which tells you where the map sheets are, and then you get the, the various map sheets. So we printed it on waterproof, tear-proof paper called Paper Tiger. And it's, it's pretty tough. Um, it should work out there in the in the rain and mist and stuff, and it's still only a dollar fifty a sheet to print. So I printed a bunch of these, and I've been selling them uh, for about twice that price. Uh, and I've been amazed by how many people have contacted me for these. Mount Isai is supposed to be a pretty quiet place, but if everyone who bought a map over the last twelve months goes there this summer, it's going to be you know, grand central station. Um, there are a few problems with this approach, which is fairly automated, right? Like I'm not doing anything. I'm not, there's not much hands-on here. Um, one of them is finding trails data. So trails data is really hard to find in British Columbia. The government officially, like if you go to rec sites and trails, they know about 5% of the trails. Those are the ones that they sponsor. Otherwise, you're on your own. So I was lucky enough to get in touch with a guy who had done the full traverse 
gave me a GPS track, and I, I represented it with this kind of tentative, we're not really sure about this light dots thing. <laughs> Um, because, the, as the park says, there is no trail. There are a few cairns. It's a route. So, uh, we have a suggestion there of how people might travel. Um, occasionally, the automatic label placement for points goes wrong. The label for Raspberry Pass usually are wound up over here. So, you know, I'll drive those into place. Oh, this is what BC Parks offers you if you go to their website. You're hoping for a trail map, or at least a map of the park, right? And, and you click on the link for map of the park, and you get this. It's brilliant. And I've phoned them and emailed them trying to coordinate around the production of these maps, and I get no answer. I'm not sure they actually, you know, they don't really want to manage the park too closely. Um, so I do have also the Canbec Trails layer, which is a, I'm treating it as a historic trails layer, right? There once was a trail there where you see the black dotted line. Um, it's probably not there anymore. So it's just for, for reference. Uh, oh, so this is my website from which I sell this. And somehow, I come up on the Google results and like the top three results, if you take the limited size of maps, which is unexpected fame. And um, it's quite nice. Uh, how many minutes do I have left there? Still got lots of time. Lots of time. Excellent. So the logical next step is where else can we take this approach, right? Automated, inexpensive maps on 11 by 17, which, by the way, when you open them in the wind while hiking, they don't like blow on your face and stuff because they're small. Um, so this is the 103P map sheet, which is Nass River, and I just tiled it out, right? And I can generate all these maps. And the idea would be, you would have a print shop, say, in your town, and they would have all these files digitally. And you would walk in and say, uh, I would like, you know, map sheet 7D, 8D, 8C, and 9C for this hike I'm doing. They print them out for you, charge you three dollars a sheet for each one, and you you walk away quite happily, having paid twelve dollars and gotten nice topographic coverage. Um, when you generalize this approach to other areas that have roads, which Monetize doesn't have, that's pretty easy. That's just the provincial digital road atlas layer. Um, so that works OK. And there's a variant, which I kind of like, where you use the, uh, this is Land Cover Canada Circuit 2000, which is a vector product that Natural Resources Canada did. Um, so you can actually distinguish between like, the deciduous forests in the valley bottom and the heavy coniferous <coughs> and the tundra and the bare rock. Um, actually, no one that I've shown this to has been excited about it yet, but I feel like it represents the landscape better. Um, it has a problem. So when you work with Land Cover Canada 2000, sometimes there were clouds, especially in BC. So we have these polygons, which are like, this was a cloud. Right. So you have to just represent it with something else like that stippled pattern and say, we don't actually know what the cover is there. And that's the story. are not, it would be easy to make them spatially referenced. Um, then you'd be selling a digital product. Yep. And uh, 
I haven't really thought of that. That's a, an okay idea. I don't think people are inclined in Mount Ziza to go out with maps on tablets because of the long period that they are out there and the uh, likelihood that it's going to snow and rain on you. But for other places, yes, that might well be something. Jeff? Yeah, I'm just wondering, you, your tapered streams are awesome. Oh, yeah, thank you. The tapered streams are simply stream order times 0 0.2 as the millimeter width of the Line. And stream order from where? Stream order is uh, in the BC provincial data. It's just uh, streams at the top of the watershed are one. After they meet, they're two, yeah. three, four, down to eight. Is that, the, is that the freshwater atlas? Freshwater atlas, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's, that's a cheap trick. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Morgan. Okay, thanks.